All right, everyone, welcome back to getting in a college coach conversation. Um, I don't think I said my name at the top of the show. My name is Ian Fisher. But if you listen to the show all the time, which you should be doing, you would already know that. Um, we have, by the way, we have a fourth host who will be joining us uh, in our host rotation. Uh, she will be familiar to many of you who are longtime fans of the show, Shannon Vasconcelos. I believe that her debut as a host is coming up next week. So keep an eye out for that. I think that's really exciting news for us internally and, and hopefully for all of you listeners as well. Um, back to our conversation about admissions trends. I think it's probably bad practice from a data management standpoint for me to always pull my own personal experience as representative of trends, but I'm going to do it anyway to say that over the time that I've been here, I have seen a real sharp increase in the number of students that are interested in pursuing computer science. I have not seen an increase of schools that those students are considering as viable options that has been commensurate with the number of students. It's still the same group of schools. You can close your eyes and see 10 to 15 of them um, just over and over in your head, UIUC, Georgia Tech, University of Washington, they just start cycling through there, right? Zaragoza, I, I, I want to start with you because I know you work with a lot of students who are interested in technology, um, interested in CS. Um, what are we observing around applicants who are pursuing this area of study? And, and what are some lessons that you might impart to the next class of CS applicants? I, I might say to widen the scope a little and be a little bit more adventurous beyond that group of schools that we, we normally see. And you know, part of the reason is exactly as you stated, there aren't that many more <laughs> schools yeah, that right. students are considering. There are many more students who want to do computer science. And so the admit rates for a lot of those schools um, has you know, diminished over time. Um, and you know, the University of Washington, you know, if you're an out-of-state student, it's much harder for you to get in. You know, oftentimes there's certain schools uh, on on a college list, and and you know it'll appear as a, a a regular reach school for a student or a probable school or a possible school, and I have to inform the family, hey, because you're either from out of state or because you're considering computer science, let's up the notch on that one, yeah. okay, yeah. so that there are no surprises in the end. Um, you know, when uh, an early decision is supposed to, to help you, it might not necessarily do that much good for Carnegie Mellon uh, if you're opting for computer science. So I, I would say, you know, the, the list of schools that are out there, you know, perhaps go a little bit more beyond that. Um, you know, there are going to be a lot of really great um, colleges, universities that might not necessarily be comprehensive universities because you know, the fact of the matter is the list that we're seeing in terms of uh, that uh, of colleges that excite students with respect to computer science happen to be, you know, a lot of those flagships or institutes of technology, those tech schools, those uh, public flagships that have broad, robust computer science programs. Um, and there are going to be some smaller colleges and universities that might be offering computer science, perhaps not necessarily from an engineering vantage point, but more uh, from a mathematical or science vantage point. And you know, if you're one of those students who might not necessarily want to go into engineering, but you do want to study computer science, you know, consider you know some of those possibilities because it might not you might not necessarily need a school with a robust engineering department. That's right. um, you know, you could be pursuing a, a Bachelor of Arts degree in computer science. It doesn't have to be a Bachelor of Science. And I don't think there are going to be any prospective employers who are going to necessarily notice the difference. Uh, the reality is you're getting a computer, you're, you're a computer science major and your courses are more than likely going to be the same. It's all of those distribution requirements and those core requirements that might be different uh, between those two kinds of uh, degrees. So broaden the scope. And with respect to the employer, I think you put your finger on something that's really important here is that a lot of the reason the computer science applicants are looking at the same set of schools is a perception that this is an important ticket for them as they think about their professional outcomes. And I've had conversations with 
you know, parents who work for major technology companies and we'll just ask them point blank, when you're hiring somebody to join your team, how important is it to you where they went to college? And they will say, not at all important. In fact, uh, there are many other things that I care about much more than where they went to school. And so I would encourage students to also look within their communities of people that are doing the kinds of work that they find interesting. Ask them what their path was. Where did they go to school? What did they study? How did they learn the skills that they use every day at work? And see whether there are, in fact, many pathways for those students to get to an outcome that they might find exciting that don't necessarily require that you go to one of those particular schools within yeah. that CS space. And it takes a little digging, but I, th I think you're right that broadening your horizons is a really great strategy there. What's interesting, you know, the question that you pose to some of those families, I sometimes pose it to some of the parents, where did you go to school? Because, you know, many of those parents <laughs> work in tech, they are, they did computer science and, you know, the list is pretty broad. Yeah. It's rare that I encounter someone who studied computer science who's um, not working or, you know, it's it's such an in-demand um, uh, profession. Um, in-demand profession, I think also growing there. Are, we saw, we talked about this back in January when we got together as a team, but there was about a 240% increase in the number of students that uh, say they're interested in pursuing computer science, the second fastest growing major behind the different health professions, um, which is quite striking. I also think that it's important to have, if you're looking at CS, you're looking at engineering, it's important to have a really good explanation for why this is interesting to you, as opposed to, well, it seems like the right answer, right? And I think that that is something you talked about, no surprises. For us, sometimes there aren't surprises for students if they say they're interested in CS, but there's no example of an interest in CS reflected in their application. We know that they're not going to be especially successful with some of those those institutions because of the kinds of applicants that they're already turning away who are competitive and able and capable. So it sometimes feels like it's a little bit of a crapshoot, but I think that there is some aspect of predictability when you're looking at students who are not competitive uh, for some of these spaces. Jen, I wanted to, we talked a little bit in the in-between about that sense of unpredictability and just not knowing exactly who's getting in where how did that show up for you uh, this year? Did you see consistency across uh, where students were getting in? Did you see, did it feel like someone just grabbed a handful of darts and threw them at a dartboard without looking? Like what, what was this uh, season like for you in terms of expectations and reality? Other, I would say apart from the the change that I noted with the publics, some of the publics, um, I would say no, it absolutely was not like a dartboard. It was very predictable. And I would say that the difference of, you know, a couple of percentage points and let's say like Dartmouth or other super duper selective schools, like it, it wasn't, I mean, I, I felt it, I noticed it, but there was never an occasion when I said to a kid, yes, I, I think you'll get into Harvard. Like that just doesn't, like, I don't know who that kid is, right? So it didn't change anything. I have a family now and I absolutely adore them. And the dad cautioned me against sort of telling the daughter as a junior that she's not going to be accepted to X, Y, and Z because I'm very blunt. And I, and I just don't like, do you want the pain to come now? Or do you want the pain to come when she does in fact get denied um, from these places? Like we could do it either way. And so, there were no surprises in that regard. Like kids that were sort of possible, like on the cusp. I, I run lists, as you know, for all of our, you know, our corporate clients along with the team. And I've never seen any of the IV plus school anywhere other than a reach, even for the most perfect kids. So, you know, yes, they got a lot of disappointment, but we expected that. And sort of on the flip side of that, as you know, my colleagues have uh, verified and has been my experience, the kids that applied sort of reasonably within the early decision and early action, you know, places for the most part had a lot of great options going into regular. And so, you know, it, it was, it, it was the most sort of, I called it a bloodshed a little bit like year, you know, it was brutal in a lot of ways, but I, I have to just say it wasn't unexpectedly brutal, if that makes sense. Like there were no surprises other than what I indicated. And I think it's important to help our listeners to understand that when Jen says it wasn't unexpectedly brutal, she is speaking with her decades of experience 
in admission and counseling and working with students. And so when she talks, she knows what she's talking about. And so if you have your, you felt it to be unexpectedly brutal. I think it's because of a, in, in many cases, a lack of an understanding of, of just what we're really talking about here and what we're looking at here. And that's part of why we want to come on the show to talk about these things for families. There are no students where I would say you're going to get into fill in the blank for one of the top 15 schools that I just would never, ever do that. And I would never be surprised if a student didn't get into any one of those schools. There are students where I would say, I wouldn't be surprised if you got into those schools too. And then there are most students where I would be shocked if they got admitted, right? Like that's just the reality of this highly, highly selective admission. It's very similar to, are you going to be an Olympic athlete or not? You kind of know it when you see it, uh, but it still is hard to make the Olympic team. Um, Zaragoza, are there things that you're noticing about the students who are most pleased with how things went this year, setting aside perhaps the kids that got into their number one choice, their ED, and they were done months ago. Are there any trends around student approach to this process that you can call out? I, I think going in with a little sense of humility, you know, in, in that sense that, you know, those students who, who went in with a, a much smaller list, um, who were a lot more reasonable um, with uh, their choice of schools, and who were very happy with their set of probables, with their set of possibles, um, you know, and who weren't so uber focused on their reaches. I think a lot of those students came out pleasantly surprised. Yeah. You know, I, I can think of two students, you know, much like we talked about, you know, who I wasn't surprised who got into those uber selective schools, but, you know, they complimented it. Um, you know, they they went in very focused. You know, there was this one young woman who wanted to be an aerospace engineer. She needed to find a school with aerospace engineering. You know, there aren't that many out there, right? And she wanted ROTC. You know, there aren't that many that, you know, kind of meet that fold. And so she wasn't necessarily going after those Uber selective schools. Some happened to be on it, just the ones that offered what she was looking for and that were a really great fit for her. And because she was such a great fit, you know, this was someone who, you know, screamed aerospace engineering and wanting to be a pilot and, and so forth. He, he, you know, it, it um, you know, she went in, came out with, with very happy results. I think some of those students who, you know, overreached, okay, and, um, you, you know, I, I, and, and I, I will say this to, to everyone, you know, strongly consider, you know, the, your, your early admission strategy, early decision, you know, there, there are, you know, that's, you know, strategic, okay, um, picking a school just simply because it's uber selective, and you just want to find out if you're going to get in, that just is not us. strategic, we'll tell you, um, because it's, uh, you miss out on the strategy, and then you're left on the in the regular decision pool, which is a bloodbath. Okay, you lose all predictability <laughs> in the regular decision pool. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I I, I think uh, most of my colleagues will, would agree um, on that point. There's a little bit more predictability in terms of the early decision pool, um, but when it comes to regular decision, who knows? It's wild. It's the wild west out there. Absolutely. I love what you said about humility. I, I immediately thought of a couple of students that I worked with this year who had every reason to be super confident going into this process and yet were very thoughtful and very uh, quick to ask for support. And were like, could this be, be you know, there was just a humility to them and they, they got some really great decisions at the end of the day. I also think that Students who could clearly articulate why the schools that they were applying to were on their list. Like if you ask them, why are you applying to this school? Why are you applying to that school? If they had an answer for each of those questions, they almost to a person are happy at this point because there are things they love. I was talking to a student I worked with yesterday who I he's so smart and interesting. He got denied from a lot of really selective schools. And we talked about that. He knew it was potentially coming but he's also super stoked about the options that he has to choose from because he applied to them with intention 
and there was something specific he was looking for. And that was really refreshing in that conversation. Jen, I want you to, is there anything that you noticed trend-wise among your students? I want to give you the last word on this um, that people can maybe channel into this year's application season. I always say that the earlier you start and the earlier you finish, the happier you'll be. It didn't necessarily work out for everybody. And honestly, I still have kids that are dealing with wait lists and they're really burnt out, but I will not ever go back on saying, if you go back to senior year with everything set, you know, in terms of your essays, for example, you will be happy. And I just hope that the kids go, you know, that are juniors right now aren't scared off by any negative results or any positive results or what happened to their friends or anything like that. Like just, you know, focus and just do your job as my coach Bill Belichick says. Oh my God. You have to finish this with mention of the Patriots. Like, what are you doing? Wait until Shannon is hosting the show. And then you can talk all about Boston sports as much as you'd like which is a great segue to remind you that Shannon Vasconcelos will be hosting the show next week. They'll be talking about how to ask for letters of recommendation from your teachers, which is a great uh, thing that you can do if you want to start early, as Jen recommends. And then we will also be answering your listener questions uh, as they come in. Zaragoza and Jen, this was a really fun segment. I wish we had more time to talk about this, uh, but thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you. All right, everyone, we will see you next week. Uh, Recommend us to a friend, give us a five-star rating and have a wonderful weekend.